Warsaw, and he saw Nauvoo as an economic competitor. And he's worried about this religion. And he starts to see the Nauvoo Legion as an opportunity to criticize the saints. And so early on in his Warsaw Signal newspaper, he's starting to attack the Mormons as this militant, violent threat to America. And he begins to write that way in his editorials. It seems that there was a competition between the Nauvoo press criticizing Sharp and Sharp criticizing the efforts to build Nauvoo. And this uh, escalated as time went on. One of Sharp's principal concerns uh, was the Nauvoo Legion and the possible uh, use or misuse of that body. Uh, things did uh, move from that point and accelerated and uh, a very serious incident occurred in the spring of 1843 uh, when someone uh, tried to assassinate uh, Governor Lilburn Boggs of Missouri. Uh, they did not succeed, but Joseph Smith and Porter Rockwell were named as chief suspects and so Joseph felt that he needed to go into hiding. Uh, went up uh, to visit on uh, some in-laws uh, property, some farm property up near Dixon, Illinois in the north. And it was during that time uh, when his uh, whereabouts were made known that uh, a party came from Missouri to arrest him and extradite him, uh, take him back to Missouri. And that's the point at which the Nauvoo Legion was used uh, to move in and, and uh, rescue the prophet and save him from, from extradition. The real problem that affects the Latter-day Saints most poignantly is going to come from within their own ranks. Now John C. Bennett had been a great help to the church in terms of establishing the Nauvoo Charter, the Nauvoo Legion, and what have you. But it's not too long before he begins to show his true colors. And the man is not a, a good man. In fact, he's quite an immoral man. And if you know your history of the church, this is also a time when Joseph is introducing the delicate principle of eternal marriage in Nauvoo. Also, a subset of that, for a temporary time, plural marriage. And that was done by the prophet Joseph and by others when he directed it to be. Bennett went ahead of the direction and began to involve himself in ways that were not discreet or morally correct and Joseph had no other choice but to excommunicate one of his, one of his favored lieutenants but by this time of course Joseph had come to know what the man was really made of and with all due respect to John C. Bennett's reputation he turns bitter against the Saints and stirs up trouble all over the place not only amongst those outside of the church but some good Latter-day Saints who choose deliberately to follow John C. Bennett's interpretation of events. As this uh, internal opposition uh, developed, uh, several uh, leading families, the often called the Laws, Fosters and Higbees, uh, banded together and uh, decided to publish a newspaper, which they called the Nauvoo Expositor. Only one issue ever came from the press, but it was very derogatory, it accused Joseph Smith of of preaching false doctrine, engaging in immoral behavior, and uh, was certainly uh, a very scurrilous piece. Uh, therefore, they, the city council under Joseph's direction met and discussed the issue, decided uh, what ought to be done, whether this should continue, uh, whether they ought to take action against it, and uh, took the drastic action of actually ordering uh, that the press be destroyed. And of course, this uh, became a big issue because freedom of the press is a is a major uh, freedom and a major right in in America. And so, this was a high risk activity. From the newspapers around us and the current reports has brought in from the surrounding country, I have good reason to fear that a mob is organizing to come upon this city and plunder and destroy said city as well as murder the citizens. And by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor, and to preserve the city and the lives of the citizens, I do hereby declare the said city within the limits of its incorporation under martial law. Uh, with Nauvoo under martial law, uh, opposition both internally and externally increased, and a part of that opposition came from Thomas Sharp, who called for settling the issue with powder and ball, obviously a, a violent solution. 
Joseph Smith, uh, fearing for his life, wrote to Governor Ford, Thomas Ford of Illinois, for protection. Uh, the governor said, I can't guarantee protection. You need to surrender yourself. And so at this juncture, uh, Joseph and others uh, discussed what ought to be done and uh, elected then to that he and some of the church members, some of the leaders, would go to the West. They'd been talking about settling possibly in the West anyway. He thought this would take the pressure off the saints in Nauvoo. As it turned out, when it was discovered that the party had left this place, Nauvoo, under greater threat, a threat of invasion, and so the decision was taken to return to Nauvoo and eventually to surrender himself to the authorities. If I do not go to Carthage, the result will be the destruction of this city and its inhabitants. And I cannot think of my dear brothers and sisters and their children suffering the scenes of Missouri again in Nauvoo. No, it is better for your brother Joseph to die for his brothers and sisters, for I am willing to die for them. My work is finished. The persecution Joseph suffered culminated in the year 1844. As unusual as it sounds, while running for President of the United States and while serving as Mayor of Nauvoo, one of the largest cities in the state of Illinois, Joseph was increasingly seen as a political and military threat. As Joseph made the journey here to Carthage to face the trumped up charges brought against him, he knew his days were numbered. I am going like a lamb to the slaughter, but I am calm as a summer's morning. I have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward all men. If they take my life, I shall die an innocent man, and my blood shall cry from the ground for vengeance, and it shall be said of me, he was murdered in cold blood. After arriving in Carthage, the prisoners were housed at the Hamilton House, a hotel a few blocks from the jail. Uh, but they were taken to jail because uh, he was being charged now with, with treason. Uh, this was a charge which was serious enough that they could not post bail, would have to be held uh, as prisoners. Uh, when they were taken to the jail, uh, they were treated very well by the, by the jailer and his family. Evidence of this favorable treatment was the fact that the jailer allowed the prisoners to spend the time in his bedroom upstairs rather than being confined to the dungeon or locked in a cell. The place itself is a very sacred place and the circumstances of that afternoon were very solemn and sacred. They read scriptures, they sang hymns, they talked about the seriousness of the situation. And it was also a very oppressive, hot, sultry June day. At one point, they asked John Taylor to sing a hymn which had become a favorite, A Poor Wayfaring Man of Grief. And of course, this centered their attention on the Savior and on the seriousness of this whole enterprise that they had engaged in. A poor wayfaring man of grief hath often cried me on my way who sued so humbly for relief that I could never answer nay. Near 515 on June 27th of 1844 there's a large mob that's gathered outside of Carthage jail. By that time they've overpowered the jailer they run up the stairs and they're starting to shoot. The four men in the bedroom, Joseph Smith, Hiram Smith, Willard Richards, and John Taylor, now each go to uh, the bed where they've hidden underneath a weapon. For Joseph and Hiram, they will grab each a gun to defend perhaps themselves and those in the room. For John Taylor and Willard Richards, they will grab the walking sticks. As they rush to the door to, uh, to close it, there will be uh, guns fired both directions. Those with the stick will attempt to knock down the guns. Finally, a bullet that shot then into the door 
will eventually end up in the body of Hiram. I will hit him in the nose.